So I have four questions, but in case something will appear more, please be free to talk. Maybe there is a question which you will miss, and this is the most common asked question for you. And um, you can also share it. Is there actually a mostly often asked question? Um, where do you start? <laughs> Yeah. How do you start with S3? I think that's one of them. Another one is, what is social 3.0? That's another common question. Um, yeah, those two, I think. Uh -huh. I have um, I had a fifth question, uh, but I think also it's, it's a bit linked with how do you start. So maybe I can ask this question. It's not more like how do you start, but I'm already in sociocracy or trying it. And I see that my friend also has his business and most probably it's good for him. How and but he has some fears. How can I help him to start or maybe I should not help him at all trying to go deeper into self-management mm -hmm. and try the system so can I as a friend help another friend integrate or apply or uh, put social equity on his uh, business model yeah okay well once again, I think it's important we make that distinction between socioxy as a general term, which is like talking around democracy. I think they're on they're on an equivalent, you know. And some people even say that in the future we would need a governance system more like sociocracy than democracy in democratic regions, at least. Um, so we're talking about sociocracy 3.0, and built into S3. Um, is the concept of driver uh, and a pattern called navigate via attention. And so navigate via attention, a bit like in holacracy, it's the same kind of concept. You're using people's sense of the environment around them and the sense making they, they do in relation to what they're sensing and perceiving to identify areas of opportunity and areas of challenge in the context of whatever it is you're aiming to do. And so, as Simon Sinek says, start with the why. That's what Navigate via Attention helps us to understand. One, that we only ever act to change things in response to a situation that seems different to what we would expect or wish to see. Um, and that everything we do grows out of that. And therefore, it's really valuable to pay attention to what it is that's motivating us to act to begin with, because it will always be, in some respect, either a perception of a tool, you know, something that's going to help us, or an obstacle, something that's going to stand in our way. And these are the two basic situations that require us to act. So in terms of your friend talking to another friend about S3, personally, I wouldn't talk about S3 to begin with. I mean, if they're having a conversation and the guy is saying, well, you know, we're, we're using S3 in this way and that way, that might be interesting. But I think the more important question is asking this question, why do you need to change anything at all? Yeah. So I, for me, if it were my friend, that would be my first question. If they were to say to me, I'm interested in S3, my next question would be, why would you be interested in that? And to help that person to unpack whatever the problem is or whatever the opportunity is that their current approach inadequately addresses somehow mm -hmm. and to start there. And so if we come full circle to what I was saying at the beginning, that's built into S3 is navigate via attention in response to drivers, situations that motivate action. But you don't need to talk about S3 to have that conversation to begin with. And so the next thing I might say, having had that conversation, would be exactly what I just described to you. You know, this is a, there's a concept in this tool we're using called driver, and there's a pattern called navigate by attention, which is basically articulating what we do as human beings when we perceive something that's not working out. We make sense of it somehow, and we figure out who should respond to it and then find ways to respond to it. So I'm kind of de, de um, what's the word? Uh, it's like removing, removing any jargon and presenting S3 in a language that makes sense to the person that you're talking to. 
And you don't need to talk about S3 at all in order to be able to do that. So I think I would start there. And then, you know, there's a very nice interview. It's like two and a half minutes long, I think, on one of our YouTube channels. Mikael Yerte, he's a consultant in Stockholm, works with Crisp. And he's telling a brief story of when he gets invited by his customers to work within a team who are having challenges around, I think the example he gives is around a meeting process, for example. So he gets invited to help them improve their meeting practice. He doesn't get invited to introduce any patterns from S3. Mm -hmm. So he'll be using patterns from S3 and inviting people to, to go with him in a process. They have a good experience from it. And then at some point later, they might ask, hey, what is it that you're doing that was different to what we're used to? And it seemed much more effective. And so when people are ready, then he might say, well, you know, there's a ton of things that I'm into. And one of them is S3. And these particular processes and patterns that we used are this and this and this. So I think that's, that's what I would say in, in answer to that. It's like present things, start with the why, present things in a language that makes sense to people. Don't be attached to mentioning S3. Um, but uh, remember that the patterns are kind of common sense ways to approach, like common sense micro frameworks to approach certain situations and they're useful some of the time. Thank you. Very familiar because most of the why people approach us to help them out is help us with the uh, uh, with the meetings, help us um, more in harmony communicate during the meetings. This is the most approach uh, which we see, and therefore we take the patterns from S3, integrate them, and I say, "Wow, it works! This is fantastic! This is really the first question." Yeah. Um, Can I say say something on that, Alona? So a very interesting anecdote recently somebody shared with me. We were talking about um, decision making and clarifying domains. And the, the guy is, he works with an organization who was a customer of ours. And he said, in the beginning, when we started to looking into S3, we thought that the decision-making processes would be the most important thing for us. And then he went on to explain what we've come to realize is that more important than the decision-making is how we distribute responsibilities to start with. And so clarifying domains, which we use the term domains in S3 a bit differently to holacracy. If you take the, the domain is like the whole area of responsibility that a role would have, for example. Um, so he said, we, we've learned that the more we're able to free people up to decide and act for themselves within clearly defined constraints, the less we need to fall back on decision-making. And so we can save that added investment of energy from multiple people in decision-making for those moments when there are dependencies and it's beneficial to bring people together. Um, but clarifying domains is a, a fundamentally important pattern. And Brian spoke about this in the conference as well, right? In uh, Holacracy, where he's explaining mapping out roles and responsibilities as a first step, and then secondly, empower roles to act. So, and then, and then have better meetings. And I think that's a, a, a meta pattern that we do well to recognize, because sometimes people might think it's, it's necessary to invest more in improving the meeting process, when part of the reason the meeting is dysfunctional is because were you to rearrange things, you wouldn't need to have that meeting at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Brian had a question at the conference actually, and it was, it sounded like, what's the difference between S3 and holacracy? Can you reply on this question? How yeah, sure. Happen? I heard that question, Victoria asked him. Um, and his, his, the way he answered interested me because to begin with, he spoke specifically to the question of S3 and holacracy, but then he brought in the, the generic term of sociocracy, and then he ballparked his conclusions around sociocracy in general and stopped talking about S3. And I thought that was unfortunate because it obscured a nuance. And the nuance is that S3 is designed specifically 
to free people up as much as possible to act and decide for themselves. And to, just as I explained just now, to leave, leave as much energy as possible for those times when dependencies exist. And it's really necessary for people to come together and have some kind of collaborative process. Whereas other interpretations of sociocracy based around the sociocratic circle method very much tend to lean in the direction that Brian was warning against, which is collaborative decision-making around all kinds of significant decisions. Um, and that's an unfortunate and quite egalitarian interpretation of um, how you would apply the decision-making processes in general. And the last thing I would say, if you go back to the norms, which were written by the sociocracy group through the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So that's like the kind of formal documentation of, uh, is like the equivalence of the constitution, I guess you could say, in holacracy. Um, they were much more clear, actually, around the importance of freeing people up to decide and act. Um, and where consent decision-making came in originally was in the team. You know, so this concept of circle was first created by Gerard Endenberg. And he argued that there was value in a team where people were affected by decisions that those people were able to make or influence those decisions you know, on the basis of clear arguments why. Um, and so the idea was to shift from a managed team to a self-governing team. Mm -hmm. where you can still have a manager or in in the sociocratic circle method speak you would have an operational leader mm -hmm. yeah but when it came to governance decisions that fell within the domain of the circle those would be made collaboratively and the argument was you would not only harness the benefit of the wisdom and experience of the leader but you would also harness the wisdom and experience of everyone else in the team as well. So you, you, you kind of flattened the hierarchy in decision-making and you enriched the results you got from the decision-making because you had these different players within the team bringing their different perspectives and ideas. Yeah. So I, as Brian did, I rail against more kind of consensus orientated, uh, egalitarian, un unanimous decision making kind of flavor that we see present sometimes in people's interpretation of consent decision making, and to the point where people feel anxious to make any decisions for themselves at all. But Brian's explanation of the strength of holacracy freeing people up, I think holacracy goes further than S3, and I think it's a mistake. I think it preferences the individual, yeah. actually, um, to a degree that's um, potentially problematic. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but besides that, S3 is designed to do exactly the same thing, free people up just to get on with stuff as much as possible, clarify areas of responsibility, and save your precious life energy for those moments when you need to talk with others to engage in some kind of collaborative process. And it's a problem with choosing to call what we developed Sociocracy 3.0. But we did that because we wanted people to recognize that there's a 170 year history behind what we're doing. Um, this was one of my grumbles around Brian with Holacracy because he kind of mentioned socio the sociocratic circle method, but really covered the path, you know, it wasn't very clear where, how much that had influenced the evolution of holacracy. But the problem with including sociocracy in your name is that then people start confusing the sociocratic circle method with S3 and with sociocracy in general as a kind of concept for government, which is what it originally was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I see. Yes, I understand. Yeah. Um, going back to S3, uh, one of the questions which we do hear quite often when the companies are not fully ready to go to S3 or to any common system is that um, they say that, well, we're doing business to make money. 
this is what we generate we generate profit and uh, we have a fear that when we start focusing on communication on people on leaders we might lose the focus on profit and we have this fear because we need the profit to feed the families of our employees and um what um uh, is there maybe uh, an advice for those people or can you comment on this because there is a fear of losing profit because there is a fear of uh, putting the focus on something that does not initially give profit yes because they don't see that it might give profit um i think this is a common question from a lot of companies who are afraid to start something new which is not um common in their country common in their society common in the people who we didn't, we didn't grow up with this because they are afraid to lose profit um do you have a an, an answer to this yeah i do if, if there's a few ways to take it and i think if we were to really unpack the answer to that question then it would require more than the time we have for this call because I'd like to start on the highest possible level. So as human beings, there's a tendency, I think, toward short term gain, mm -hmm. despite the fact it might lead to long term pain. And why I'm saying that on the highest level is if you look at the world today, there are some serious issues with our resource consumption, with the impact of our actions on environment, for example, on ourselves, um, and that are that are destructive and in the long term have deeply concerning consequences. Yeah, um, you know, even some kind of catastrophic and existential threats. And there are things that we as human beings can do to mitigate against those things. We, we actually know a lot about what we could do, but the argument is that you need some kind of global coordination to be able to deal with some of those big issues. And the vulnerability is if I invest time and energy into, I don't know, let's say more regenerative ways of running my business, forget sustainability, because you know we need to get past sustainable. We need to regenerate environments. It's not just about sustaining things. But um, if I decide to do that in my organization, that requires some investment, right? And meanwhile, if somebody else says, screw that, well, those guys are busy figuring out how to act in a more kind of holistically responsible way, I'm going to take this opportunity to get a bit more profit, right? then I'm much more anxious to invest energy in learning how to do things differently and whatever it would require to do that, because I'm going to get screwed by whoever my competitor is. Right. So this is a, this is a, um, a species wide problem we have. Mm -hmm. And, and if we don't solve global coordination adequately, our children are going to pay massive consequence. They're going to pay a massive price for that. Yeah. And I think anyone who's taking an honest look at the world today can see that I'm not exaggerating the strong possibility that there are going to be some very serious issues that we have to deal with in future because we're not dealing with them today. So that's, that's one part of the framing of my answer to your question. You can localize that as well, right? So if you come just into an organizational context instead of a global context, you look at self-management, right? What, what does it require to decentralize power to influence through the system in a way that most enables that community of people to achieve what it is that they say they want to do together, right? So we've got a, a traditional approach to managing a system like that and handling that global, that global coordination through the system through a management hierarchy. But as complexity increases, one, it becomes harder and harder because you can't manage complexity in a centralized way. Mm -hmm. um, you can only like support the evolution of better ways within the organization to be able to navigate. Um, and you also need 
a more kind of educated populace of people throughout the organization, because if you're going to decentralize authority to influence, those people better be able to handle that decision making in an effective way, both locally and globally throughout the, the system. Okay. So mm -hmm. without appreciating the need for decentralizing authority to influence and appreciating the need to invest in learning everybody, then it doesn't make so much sense to proceed down that road too far because it's likely to lead to ineffectiveness in the system because you haven't installed a better way to manage the system than the old way of doing it, right? So this is, this is a second kind of problem and it's a, a, a second part of framing my answer to you. Let me see if I can articulate what the, the third problem was at the moment. So I think I need to just back up Alona and, and double back on the, on the question. So it was when, yeah, when there's vulnerability and anxiety around moving toward self-management. Okay. The, the third component is the human component. So there is adequate research in the world that shows that over the long term, engagement of people in organizations is fundamentally important for that organization to achieve its greatest potential for profitability. Because when people are meaningfully engaged in what they're doing, they go beyond the call of duty and they're willing to give more of their all. And so that organization will inevitably benefit from having people who want to be there, who have a sense of uh, ownership over what's happening, are able to influence in ways that are meaningful and contribute their best in that system. But once again, in order to pivot in that direction from a more traditional management hierarchy, you need that investment into helping people learn how to do that in a good way. This is one of the arguments Brian gives for holacracy, right? He says, if you want to try and figure out self-management for yourself, it's really hard and it's, you know, there's many false paths and it's difficult and here's holacracy, ka -ching. you know, it's like it's off the shelf. You can just install the whole thing into your system teach people the rules and it's going to help you to, to, to have a good start, you know, and there'll still be many things you need to figure out, but it's putting in place some constraints. And I, I agree with him in that respect. I think that that can be a way to make that pivot. And, and what, it, what holacracy requires is training people about the rules, right? They need to learn how to do it differently um, so that it doesn't all go to, it doesn't all become a chaotic kind of mess, right? Mm -hmm. So coming back to profitability, if you're looking at your quarterly returns, then you're not going to see much attractive about moving towards more self-management because you, know, you, you might be just needing to reach your targets for the next three months. And so the idea of investing in something that's going to require people's time, because it takes time for people to learn, um, investing in something that means that to begin with, people will try doing things differently and they're going to make mistakes and it's going to be clunky and there's going to be misunderstandings and that's all going to be waste, you know, in the short term. Um, unless you appreciate the longer term benefits of an investment in developing a more decentralized way to coordinate because in the long term, it's going to make you more effective. Then it's very hard to see the arguments why you would do that in the short term. And so I think, you know, there's this meta meta meme a focus on short term gain mm -hmm. and, and kick the can down the road and leave our kids to clear up the mess, you know, somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. versus versus you know the benefits of recognizing that trajectory and daring to dream of what it would look like that our children inherit a world where organizations are in, like intentional willing communities of people working together towards common goals because that's what 
lights their fire and gets them out of bed in the morning. And that's what they're passionate about. And they care deeply about it. And they're committed to that and are, are willing to give their best in service of that. That will lead to so much more care in the world, so much more willingness to take responsibility for things. And in the long term, can only lead to far more effective organizations than we have today. But it requires that investment in the short term, yeah. which is going to cost. And I think this is a lot of the reason why we see this problem. And that, and that concerns me because it's, because it's not just a local problem. It's a global problem. Um, and, and I think these are important questions for leaders in organizations to be asking, you know, around, do they want to kind of redirect the tr growing trend that most companies last m much less time today than they used to 20 or 30 years ago, for example? You know, do they really want to invest in the resilience of organizations over the longer term? Yeah. Because if they do, then you have to kind of get past this prioritizing of short-term gain and start looking at the long-term pain you're likely to experience through continuing doing things the way you do. Mm -hmm. I hope I managed to answer that in some yes. way. It's, a, it's yes. not an easy question for me to answer. But. Very deep. Very deep. Thank you. We have a question about the leader, actually, in S3. Just a second. Um, uh -huh. So there are two questions of about the leaders in our stream. So the first one is, I would like to reveal the topic of leadership more deeply. What do the leaders of self-management do differently? Do differently? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what's the difference between the self-management, the S3 leader and the original leader? of uh, regular management. Yeah, okay. Well, let me think about that. So firstly, the, the term leader is a very broad term, right? So in some way, all of us lead in some respects. And I like to replace the word leadership with influence. And so um, all of us have the potential to create impact in the world somehow. And so in the context of an organization, essentially what we're doing is distributing power to influence through the system. Yeah. So, and that frees people up to lead in particular areas in particular ways. Uh, and that can include also influencing other people. And there can be social contracts within the organization that says, when you tell me to do X and I will do X, for example. Yeah? And if that makes sense in the context of the organization, then uh, that's probably a good idea that I do what you tell me to do. We might have a two-way relationship where you lead on some things and I lead on other things. So another moment I might tell you, hey, Alona, I think it would be great if you could focus some energy on this today. You know, so we leadership can go both ways in that respect. I don't personally have a problem with leadership hierarchies in organizations, if it makes sense. You know, so people who take responsibility for kind of higher level, big picture domains within the system and that they make decisions either themselves or with others, then influence many within within that. I think that's perfectly legitimate when there's a clear driver for doing so. The massive difference, I think, that Gerard Endenberg introduced with consent decision-making was this concept of objection, right? And so he said, fine, we can have a leadership hierarchy where people are leading and influencing others and maybe leading on coordinating work, but let's have enough transparency in the system that if anybody in the system sees a reason why proceeding in the way that leader suggests will lead to consequences you want to avoid in that system or 
they can see a way that a worthwhile way that that could be improved, then they should speak up. And that's the concept of objection, basically. And what that does is it, let's stay with the traditional management hierarchy, for example. If you introduce uh, objections into the system and you're playing the game of consent, which from an S3 point of view, we mean raise, seek out, and resolve objections to decisions and actions. People can lead all they like, right? And you can distribute power to influence the people according to what makes sense. And those people are free to act and make decisions that affect others. But if anyone sees at any point where there's a problem with that, then that objection, that argument they bring is more powerful than the leader. And this is a very interesting shift, I think, that consent decision-making invites. It's shifting supremacy from people, whether that's people in a leadership hierarchy or supremacy from a majority in a majority decision-making, as two examples. It shifts supremacy to an argument that can demonstrate why that particular decision leads in a way we wouldn't want it to, or an argument that demonstrates how to improve it. And and so classic sociocracy, the sociocratic circle method, has a pattern called operational leader, right? Um, in Gerard's context, that was an engineering company. It's a more kind of complicated environment in some respects. And it made sense to have a, a functional leadership hierarchy for coordination of work through the system. But objections reigned supreme over that hierarchy of functional leaders. And then decision-making was distributed through the system in, into circles. The, to come to S3, so when Bernard and I first started looking at pulling together what became S3, we had a conversation about leadership and what, what do we have a pattern called leader in S3? And actually, if you read the, the, the practical guide, you'll see we talk about influence. We don't talk about leadership and we talk about distributing influence through systems. So we decided not to have a pattern called leader. We decided we would just have a pattern called role and we would have a pattern called clarify and develop domains. And so with the invitation to think carefully about how you distribute um, power to influence through the system and how you constrain it in a clearly defined domain, um, so that people can lead within that domain. And then you add, this, add the safety mechanism of objection. So you're opening the system to receive any information from anywhere when someone perceives some kind of decision or some kind of activity or proposal of a decision that is problematic somehow. You're going to get that insight into the consciousness of the system and to those people who are leading there yeah so that they can integrate that wisdom and evolve their decision or their current activity on the on the basis of it so s3 frees everybody up to be a leader within their domain and it also frees everybody up and it encourages people to pay attention to things that are happening in their environment and to be on the lookout for any possible problems with that. And it creates an environment where people feel safe to speak up because, you know, in a traditional organizational system, if I challenge the boss, maybe I lose my job or it's career limiting, you know, <laughs> whereas in an organization that's um, it, it, it adopted this concept of uh, objection, then I can speak up without fear because I know that what I share is going to be received as a possibly valuable perspective that can help us to improve. And the last thing I'd say is this. I think we need to shift from the idea of hierarchies to heterarchy. And the, the concept of a heterarchy is an organizational system that's continuously adapting according to need and distributing power to influence, distributing responsibilities and clarifying areas of autonomy according to the needs. You know? And then as and when those needs change, so that system is continuously readapting. So you kind of have pop-up hierarchies, you know? Uh, and so it, it can be perfectly legitimate to give power to lead to somebody. Yeah. Um, but there's a reason for it. Um, 
So you're always leading with the why, and there's always a way to change things if it turns out that that particular, the, d- the decisions or the activities associated with that leadership prove to be problematic somehow, leading to consequences you'd rather avoid or that there are ways to improve. Thank you. And um, um, so there's also a question. It's a bit links with what you just said with your answer. Um, it sounds like I am in doubt about the idea of giving up power. What is personal motivation for those who have already power to give up that power? Mm-hmm. Did you ever have this chance to talk with people? Yeah, well, in the S3 online learning community this month, our theme is power. Um, so that's that's what we're exploring. Again, let's start by clarifying that. So power is like a, I gave the example the other day of the battery in my preamp here. I've got a rechargeable AA battery. So that battery, if I don't use it, the power remains in the battery for a long time. Maybe it, it, it leaks away over time. So power is, you know, it's just a, yeah, it's like a, energy can't be created or destroyed. It's just there. And as human beings, we, we are able to exercise power to influence the world somehow. Okay? Um, on the other side of power is vulnerability. And vulnerability is our susceptibility to be influenced right? Mm -hmm. So in the world, we are playing the game of influence and being influenced, you know, and some people are more comfortable to influence than be influenced. And some people are more, maybe not comfortable, but willing to be influenced rather than to dare to influence. Okay. And there's lots of reasons for that, but a lot of it goes back to our childhoods and our early experiences and the environments we grew up in. Because if we were taught that it was better to have power and to influence than to be influenced, uh, and in fact, we experienced situations where being influenced by others didn't turn out to be very good for us, you know, because our well-being or our well-being was threatened in some way, then we might even choose to pursue power over being vulnerable wherever possible. And then there's other people whose experiences, early experiences teach them that if they try to challenge things and influence things, then it's going to turn out worse for them. You know, and so you have the people who tend to identify more with vulnerability and then they're just susceptible to what what's kind of happening around them. So we've got these kind of power vulnerability dynamics playing out in human systems, and we've got people who preference one over the other and vice versa. When you're willing to exercise power in the world, then you're able to influence the world around you. And that feels pretty good because that's fundamental to our sense of well-being. And when you're anxious to exercise power in the world, or when you're in a situation where you can't, that feels pretty terrible because on some deep instinctual level, we know that exercising power to influence is important for our well-being, And so we live in a state of continuous threat instead, you know, feeling threatened somehow and, and feeling vulnerable and susceptible to whatever might happen around us. So whoever this person is who's saying, well, you know, I'm anxious to give up power. The first question, not to ask them, but to have in mind is, I wonder what your story is around power and how you, your life journey that led you into a position where you're willing to take power today and where you're anxious to let go of it. Because is it that, so is it that they're anxious to let go of it because they have a deep sense of responsibility for the organization and they truly believe that their influence in the organization in the way that they exercise it right now is best for the organization. And when they consider letting go of some of that, their deepest concern is those really important things that need taken care of in this organization won't be taken care of anymore. And that will be bad for this organization. And I'm going to die for this organization and its well-being. And I'm not going to let something come in and destroy everything that I'm so deeply committed to. Okay, that's like the honorable the honorable insistence on maintaining power. It might not be true, right? Uh-huh. That they might 
maintaining power will lead to this, but at least you can say well, that's a, they're in integrity and that's a pretty cool perspective, even though it might not be entirely right. But then on the other side, the personal side is, I, I don't want to let go of power because I am anxious of being influenced. And I've spent my whole life investing in setting myself up in a place where I have the influence and others don't. I'm high up on the stack. And the idea of opening myself to be influenced by others is reactivating some early childhood traumas and anxieties that I have. And I, I don't even know about those because I don't even want to consciously acknowledge that that's the fact. And therefore, I'm not even going to engage in a conversation around this. And I can't because to engage in that conversation is to make myself vulnerable. It's to kind of open to the possibility there's something I don't know about out there and there's something I don't know about in here as well. So you've got these two kind of poles, right? On the one end is like the, the intention to exercise power in an organization because it's fundamentally valuable for the organization to influence things in this way and wanting to protect that somehow. It's like a, a radical conservatism, right? And then on the other end is the personal, which is much more difficult to quantify sometimes, which is around people's personal relationship to power and why they happen to be an individual who has gone through life in a way where they have managed to amass a lot of opportunity to influence and they're reluctant to let that go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's something that's on my mind when I talk to leaders, I'm not, I'm not having that conversation with them, you know, and I'm not kind of psychoanalyzing them on the spot, but I'm just mindful of the fact there's very good reasons why people often in their very early lives opted to avoid vulnerability and to try to maximize their potential to influence as much as possible. And that, that kind of uh, egoic construct can be very detrimental in organizational systems, you know, because it leads to the kind of hegemon who seeks to maintain power at all cost, regardless of whether or not that's in the interest of the overall integrity of the, of the system. And at its far reaches, you have uh, sociopathy, psychopathy, you know, where. Yeah someone is just not able to be vulnerable somehow. Yeah. The, the other thing, maybe just to mention, I, I keep this more brief, but we have to have conversations about power in organizations. You know, fundamentally it's about how you, <clears throat> how are we going to use our limited time, energy and resources to achieve what it is we say we want to achieve together. They're, they're limited. You know, our time is limited. The, what we have available to achieve things is limited. And the energy we have available to do things is limited as well. So we, we can exercise power in ways that are more profitable, more valuable, more useful, or more wasteful somehow. And so if you're in an organization where overall the the, the total energy and investment that goes into the system leads to kind of suboptimal output from the system, then you have to say, how can we optimize the system somehow? How can we optimize to use the power we have available in ways that achieve better results? And arguably in any organizational system that's dealing with complexity, part of the answer to that has to be in distributing power throughout the power to influence throughout that system in ways that enable overall those people to create more value than they're currently able to achieve in a more centralized way. And that's not about getting rid of centralized coordination. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not arguing that you should just throw that away. It's just about thinking both and and asking where does it make more sense to distribute power to influence and where does it make more sense to keep it more centralized? And if you add in clarifying domains, if you add in the idea of everything's an experiment so you can iterate and evolve things based on what you learn, if you add in the idea of starting with your area of greatest need, don't change everything, but start somewhere where it makes sense to change things because the people who have authority to influence that already know that it's suboptimal and it would be worthwhile to try something new. 
add in objections so that you can safety check and tap into the distributed intelligence through the system. So you can pick up on things that you personally might not see, but somebody else sees instead. These kinds of things all come together to create a very robust system. But as I was saying earlier in the call, in order to achieve that, people need to learn how to do it. And that also requires a lot of unlearning about the old ways of doing it. And it requires a willingness to step up and take responsibility more, you know, and to recognize that the consequences of our actions and in inactions will are inevitable, you know, and that we have a part to play all of us in, in uh, taking responsibility for organizations that we're part of. I had a question about, can you give an advice to those who would like to start? And you just <laughs> reply to it almost. And there's one more question I have um, from uh, Oil Energy. Um, um, what's the hardest in a S3? What's the toughest in S3? What's the most complicated in S3? I'm just trying to translate the word mm -hmm. into uh, English okay. pattern. So what's the most complicated in S3? Like the most complicated pattern or the most complicated? Um, well, I think, can we talk about the approach? What's yeah. the most complicated when we approach S3? What's the most complicated when we drive it in? What's the most complicated when we already use S3 approach management? Yeah. Okay. Well. And maybe an advice uh, for those yeah. who are... Yeah. Okay. Well, well, again, first of all, in one, in one way, what I'm about to say uh, diminishes S3. And so I'm going to come back and then contradict slightly what I say. Mm -hmm. But in the first instance, there's a, one, one of the things that's toughest is helping people get past this idea the S3 is something that you do, right? It's like holacracy is something that you do. The sociocratic circle method is something that you do. We're using the sociocratic circle method. We're using holacracy. Yeah, this would be a legitimate way to describe that. But if you say we're using S3 and you leave it at that, that's inadequate. Because what you're really saying is we are using certain patterns from S3. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're not you, you, you don't use all the patterns all of the time. You just you opt for certain patterns some of the time. OK. Um, and, and so I think that's one of the toughest things for people to get their head around because they're going to objectify S3. They're going to lump it together with a scaling framework or with something like holacracy. And they're going to kind of nail it down and say, well, is this something we want to use or not? And that's a ridiculous question because if you look at any organization, whether even a traditional management hierarchy, they will be using certain patterns that you will find in S3, right? Because S3 is a menu of typical patterns you see being used in different organizational contexts, right? But you won't see all of the patterns. And, and when somebody comes to S3 and they say, well, you know, what, what does it look like to to adopt S3, you have to start by saying, your question doesn't make sense and I'm gonna tell you why and you explain what I just explained, right? It's like, if I go to the hardware store and I need a, a screwdriver because I couldn't find mine, I don't buy every tool that's in the hardware store and take them all home. I just take the screwdriver because that's what I need, okay? But I know I can go back to the hardware store and I know if I need another tool, I can find another tool there as well. It's a simpler, it's a, simplifying metaphor, but it approximately describes what, what I'm trying to say. So that's one of the hardest things because if people don't appreciate that about S3, then they're, they're either going to think, well, maybe I'm looking for this whole system solution or maybe I'm not because they misunderstood it to begin with. On the other side of that, <laughs> the other thing that's hard is, okay, well, there's all of these individual pieces, all of these individual tools. Um, so, well, maybe there's something that's useful for there and maybe not. But you can actually take a number of these different patterns and piece them together to create 
enormously powerful systems for coordinating work, for making and evolving agreements and achieving ob objectives at a large scale, right? So you can build systems using S3 patterns, synergizing other approaches and patterns that you might have within your organization to create really powerful frameworks for organizing, okay? So as I said in my call during Business with Meaning, you can build holacracy out of S3 patterns. If you, if you take holacracy apart, all the pieces, and you rename things slightly, and you show how certain tools are applied in different places, you can see the bits and pieces that put holacracy together. It's just a particular configuration and arrangement with a few kind of constraints added here and there to create holacracy as a kind of unique system. You could create something that looked 90% like holacracy, but slightly different. You know, You could change a few. Things you could introduce the the principle of consent into holacracy. Yeah, you you can you can make small changes which would have a significant change in how that that system plays out. So the other thing that's difficult then is for people to grasp the potential of pulling several of these different patterns together in adopting the principles of S three and using some of these concepts. Um, because there's not one particular picture that you can paint that's going to help people to grasp what that looks like, right? Because it's going to be nuanced and different in different cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think that's well, we've learned that that's been one of the one of the biggest challenges for people to recognize the value of S3, they, because they're like, okay, well, there's all these. This, there's almost too many options, so I won't choose any options, and I'll go to something like holacracy instead. You know, and then maybe three years later, they say, well, we're post holacracy now because you know that it taught us some good things, but it didn't work out so well, and and now we're kind of looking more at patterns from S3. That's an interesting evolutionary journey. I've seen a lot of organizations go on because they needed some kind of starting point, you know, and they chose holacracy for that. Later, they found limitations in it because it wasn't a total cultural fit or there were certain aspects that were just, what would be the word? Well, there's many reasons, right? But one of them might be it's just, it just doesn't work for them or it's overkill. You know, it's too, too process heavy or whatever. And then they look for something more lightweight and start to adapt things. But they, they arrive at that conclusion based on a learning journey that they had through adopting something like holacracy first. And my question always is, how can I present S3 to people in a way that helps to communicate the promise of it and help people to recognize just like the, the, the deep common sense in starting where you are, prioritize airing of needs and taking an iterative approach. And at the same time, understanding the bigger picture of what it looks like to synergize different patterns from S3 to create a conscious responsive, adaptive organism in the organization, harnessing the fuller potential of everybody that's involved, which is what S3 can achieve. It's what holacracy can achieve to a point, I think, as well. So. And talking about the advice, can you give like three short advices to those who want to start and they just need, you know, a really wise advice from James? How okay. to well we'll have a have a good reason mm -hmm. you know, be sure that what you're currently doing isn't good enough uh, prioritize those reasons so start somewhere and ideally have buy-in from the top <laughs> have buy-in from the top and even more ideally, start at the top, <laughs> right? So if you're, if you're a manager responsible for an organization somehow, mm -hmm. then try these things out for yourself first. Where are you and your colleagues in your management team or wh wherever that might be struggling somehow to take care of things in the way that you would like to? And look to S3 to see if there's things that can help there. And, and experiment with patterns first for yourself. Because if you know, you're overall responsible for the system right now, 
And therefore, you don't want to go investing into things that aren't going to help you to add value you know, and achieve things in a better way. Um, and so I think if you, if you have that buy-in from the top and, and people who carry that overall responsibility for the organization see utility in it, then that's a really, really great place to start. And I'm not discouraging people in organizations who, from their perspective, looking up the system, think there's no way things are ever going to change from considering patterns from S3, because you know, there's many patterns that are going to help you have a much better day locally, wherever you are in the system. Um, but there, there's the potential of a glass ceiling, you know, where you're not going to get any further. And as I've seen tragically in some cases, there's a potential of leadership to come in and just kind of pivot things in a totally different way. And that can be disheartening. Um, I think Brian's tried to achieve this with the constitution in holacracy. In S3, we've got bylaws. But, you know, in, in any case, you, you can have a constitution, you can have bylaws. But still, if you have a new leadership come in, then they, they can turn things another way. So... We need an educated public, but we also need an educated leadership. And we need to get past this kind of leader follower worldview towards one where we recognize the necessity for coordination and collaboration across the system. And leadership starts to see itself more as you know, responsible for investing in the system so that everybody can find a better way to proceed. Yeah like a more a, a facilitative and enabling function of leadership mm -hmm. yeah, that distributes power to influence in the best possible way. Yeah. The influence and not the leader in the influence. So mm -hmm. I remember I will take, I'll take this with me. Um, James, thank you very much. This has been a super fantastic one hour with you discussion. I'm thrilled <laughs> and excited. Thank you very much for this. Um, um, very, I think that our Russian uh, um, uh, community of S3 and self-management will for sure enjoy this interview. And there are, I'm very happy that you had this hour for us and uh, had a deeper dive into the questions. And we will share this with the teams. And I hope more people will be, as we say, injected <laughs> with S3 method and the patterns and would like to see and think and look through and ask with a why um, and start with, start with a why. And um, thank you very much for this uh, interview. I'm very happy that you had this opportunity with us hour to answer the questions we had after the conference business with me. Me too, Alana, and thank you so much for giving me the time as well. And I enjoyed to be uh, able to offer some responses to those questions that we weren't able to cover the other day. <laughs>